are a God kind species. We are the mirror image of God. God rules heaven invisible, man rules earth visible. Yes? The son of perdition, the flesh, died for your sin. That one is, is taken up, it, it dies, it is. That one cannot be resurrected. The flesh of Jesus cannot be resurrected. Otherwise, we resurrect. If there are three the gods, then God is unknown. Then you do not know him. You know of him, but you do not know him. Good day, friends and family. Uh, today, I want us to quickly look again once more uh, at a CIMI, Christ International Church's sort of teaching, uh, and specifically sort of their central uh, nuntius, their central doctrine surrounding specific ideas. Uh, first of all, I'm going to start off by looking uh, at uh, uh, their idea of man. Uh, I'll show that it's very anthropocentric, as I said before. Uh, that ultimately the purpose of man is to become a God species. Secondly, we're going to look uh, quickly at God's purpose, and ultimately they believe God's purpose was to produce this God species. Uh, and third, we're going to look at Jesus, the understanding of Christ. They show that Christ was just a man, and for uh, for basically thirty years he was just a man. And after that, the anointing at the River of Jordan, he became the anointed one. He became the ascended man. He became that God species which they speak of, and he became Christ. Uh, and then, uh, and number four, I'm going to look at sort of the triunity of God, the understanding of the, the biblical doctrine of the Trinity. Do they have an understanding of the biblical doctrine of the Trinity? And then ultimately, uh, we're going to just uh, go through central teachings. Also, I just want to mention, we're going to look specifically at the view on the resurrection. Uh, Zandre mentioned Jesus didn't rise bodily from the dead. Uh, so hold to your horses and let's just have a look. So for 2,000 years, God said, repent, repent, repent. All the revivals was just for, to repent, for us to repent until the seventh and the third day and the kingdom would start. And the second coming of Christ, the resurrection of Christ would start to come. And the species would understand who they are. And now we start to live like a kingdom. I mean, we don't have a triune God teaching. We do not teach Jesus is God. And we have started to build a kingdom. We are exactly the opposite. What CIM International teaches is found everywhere in the Bible and is actually something we can read instead of interpret. Friends, here again, we need to understand that this church truly believes that whatever truth they have to reveal is ultimately the truth that is for everyone and it's new. For, as he just explained, the previous revivals that were observed were always calling people towards repentance. And then ultimately, this revival now is calling people to a higher self or an enlightenment. Let me just also just caution you and say to you in the first clip I did in Afrikaans, I looked at a few aspects of what it means when we look at a cult. And, and let me just tell you that, first of all, if you want to recognize a cult, make sure you know what they believe about Christ. Secondly, look and know that the language they use might, even though it sounds the same as ours, might be totally different and they might even interpret specific words differently, even though we think they have the same meaning. Thirdly, we need to understand that there's always a demand of new revelation. Uh, they're usually not orthodox um, and usually they are uh, uh, absolutely a, a variant far, further away from what was deemed orthodox. For the last few years in the church. Number four, uh, there's also a demand usually from cults that they are ultimately orthodox and biblical. Let me just say to you, when we look at Christ in the International, we can see quite clearly that the very doctrine they are treating and teaching, and we'll look at their doctrine uh, of man right now, is man-centered and not biblically Christ-centered. And this is religion's biggest problem, and I'm going to show it to you this morning. Each and every Facebook statement out there starts off wrong when they take us on because they do not know what is the value of a son of man, a mankind. Now, I want, to un I want you guys to understand this. Remember, the only thing God ever paid for was mankind. Mankind is so precious that God was willing to make a plan of a cross not just to save mankind, but to regenerate mankind, to make a new species of Adam. Because the plan of God is inside man. He's, we started reading the scriptures from this view, judgment and opinion. And the effect was 41 to 43,000 different denominations of democracy. It affected the way we interpreted the revelation of God. Let's look at Psalm 8. Let, let's read Psalm 8. I, I just took... I just took an hour 
to tell you Jesus how Jesus had to be born from above to become a second Adam. So he became the first Christ Adam. The moment he was born from above at the waters at the Jordan River, the Spirit of God and Jesus' Spirit became one. Jesus was born out of a woman, Mary, but also out of the womb of Jerusalem, the place where we are born from. Yes? So when Jesus Christ took his flesh to the cross, the flesh of Jesus became sin. The corruptible body became sin. That body, if one died, then all died. But Jesus Christ, the spiritual one, also went into death and was resurrected. That one passed over. That one set you free. The son of perdition, the flesh, died for your sin. That one is, is taken up. It, it dies. It is that one cannot be resurrected. The flesh of Jesus cannot be resurrected. Otherwise, we resurrect the sin. Think about it. So the flesh of Jesus died so that your flesh can die. Jesus Christ, the first Christ, passed over. That one is incorruptible. It cannot die. You were bought with that blood, the spiritual blood, not the flesh blood. The flesh blood had become sin. Then you are willing to pay 40 rand to get that milk. And although they are equal value, because that's something you decide, I decide to give 40 rand in exchange for the milk. The milk is more important than the 40 rand. Come on, guys. You want the milk more. That's why you're willing to exchange the 40 rand for that milk. Now, I want you guys to understand this. You are more important than Jesus Christ. You are in the exact same value as Jesus Christ because God had to pay with Jesus Christ, not the God, because you're not a God. God had to pay with your exact the exact same exchange rate, the exact same value, because they had to. What is real handle? What is? Uh, they had to exchange one another. But although you and Jesus Christ are equal in value, because God had to pay with Jesus Christ to. By you, God had to give Jesus Christ up to buy you. You were more important than Jesus Christ. Many Jesus Christs were more important than Friends, one. so much have been said right now. Zandre ultimately comes out and he says that man is more important than Jesus Christ. And then he goes on and he says that many more Jesus Christs were sort of, or Christs, were, were, were made through the death of Christ. And ultimately this was the goal of God. You know, it's just sad to see that whenever... Man is elevated. Christ ultimately becomes less. Uh, that is again the central sort of perversion of what we see in this teaching. Uh, Christ in the international ministries is anthropocentric. This simply means that the goal, the aim, and sort of the heart, the desire of God is ultimately man. Uh, and we see that, you know, it, it, the reason they sort of can throw away so easily the triune God is because when you believe in the triune God, you ultimately believe that God in himself, if he is a triune God, is complete. Because God is ultimately love. For God to be love, he had to be loving. Which means, um, and you can look at Richard Swinburne's argument, for God to be ultimately love, he had to have a counterpart to act his love and to express his love towards. Ultimately, two people does not make sort of the ultimate connection in love. A third is needed. But ultimately what we see in scripture is sort of a mutual indwelling of this love. And ultimately what we call the communicatum idiomatum, we can call it the, the perichoresis, the mutual indwelling of one another in the purposes of God to establish for generation of man and to establish for his own love that is complete in himself. You see, and God being completed in himself ultimately means that God is not a unitary God that is dependent on creation. God is complete in himself. Also, we need to understand that God, if God is truly triune, he is truly sufficient in himself. You see, what is depicted by Zandra is that God is sending Christ out uh, on behalf of us to deify us. Uh, and God is not sending Christ on behalf of his love. And that's what we see in John 3, 16. Is we're seeing a God that is sending not on behalf of man's worth, but he is sending man, specially from his own self-desire of love to save man. For God so loved man that he gave his only begotten son, that whomsoever believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We also see 
uh, that Zandre says, and he repeats this so often, and it's just frustrating to hear that there's 41 to 43,000 different denominations. Let me just say to you, there is not 43 or, or even 41,000 different denominations. In actual fact, you can go have a, have a Google, uh, something that David A. Barrett wrote, uh, uh, wrote a, a while back on, uh, on specifically there being sort of 20, uh, 21 uh, dif different Protestant traditions. Uh, that does not mean, denominations does not mean variants of belief. It simply means that certain things within those traditions are taken in a different light. But ultimately, true orthodox biblical Christian denominations, okay, means that they hold on to what I would deem sort of the apostolic creed, the divinity of Christ, uh, the triune God, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the ultimate belief in Christ, as being the propitiation for our sins and the vindication of mankind. You know, uh, this is ultimately what all these denominations should believe in. Uh, thirdly, I, I just want you to notice as well that when Zandre speaks here, he, he speaks of mankind being precious. But, you know, do you see that he speaks about flesh and then he speaks of spirit? Uh, uh, let me just say to you that this idea that flesh is ultimately bad and spirit is ultimately good is not something new. This is what is called Gnostic dualism. N now, let me just say to you that Gnostic dualists simply believed that, uh, you know, there, there was a, a inherent difference or dualism between flesh and spirit. And ultimately, the aim was for us to be sort of released from or freed from the flesh and for us to walk ultimately in the good purposes of life in the spirit uh, now gnostics did believe and cmi uh, i d does not believe i believe in physical death to attain this spiritual walk but you can simply attain this spiritual walk sort of in the annunciation and acceptance of christ not of jesus not the flesh jesus but of the spiritual christ that was ascended or ascended to the father we also see that there's sort of a understanding that ultimately the aim is that spirit is good versus uh, the the flesh which is bad uh, i just want to read you something you know because we've heard that that ultimately everything that christ and god have wrought sort of in the flesh is bad uh, and let me just read you a scripture in, in hebrews chapter 10 verse 10 it, it says the following it says the following it says and by that will we have been sanctified through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Verse 20 repeats that so beautifully and shows us as well that ultimately it is not just through Christ's spiritual death that we've attained the full inheritance of salvation, but also through his body. L let me read this to you in verse 20. It says the following. It says, uh, we have bought us to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, through the physical blood of Jesus doesn't say Christ, through the physical blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he has inaugurated for us, through the curtain, that is his flesh. You see what Zandra is teaching is that it's only through the spiritual life, the Christ that was spiritual, that we attain salvation. No, Zandra, you're wrong. Scripture says it's through the actual body of Jesus Christ that was rented for us, that we can come to an understanding of the purpose of God and the freedom we have in Jesus Christ. Uh, and let me just say, he also said that, he, he made the following statement. He said that the flesh ultimately resurrects sin. Therefore, Jesus did not rise uh, uh, physically, but he rose spiritually. We will deal with that later and see that Jesus rose bodily from the dead. But let me just say, if, he, if, he, if Jesus broke the power of sin according to the scriptures in his flesh, a physical resurrection uh, does not mean a sin resurrection. It simply means that Jesus was resurrected from the dead in his physical body. Uh, let me just read you a few scriptures. Uh, in Colossians chapter 1 verse 22, it says the following. Paul speaks and he says the following. He says, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through the death to present you holy, unblemished and blameless in his presence. And let me also read you something from Romans chapter 7 verse 4. Romans chapter 7 verse 4 says the following. He says, therefore, my brothers, you also die to the law through the body of Christ. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 uh, uh, verse, uh, I think it's verse 16. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 16 says the following. It says, and we are reconciled, both of them to God, in one body through the cross by which he extinguished their hostility through the body of Christ. 
how much more do we have to see and say that it was not just this spiritual effect of the life of Christ that wrought salvation for us, but also the physical death and propitiation of Christ's body being slown and being broken for us. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24 is just a beautiful scripture that these hyperfaith healers like to preach about when they preach healing. But listen to what it says. It says, by his stripes in his body we were healed. It is through the physical uh, 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 sort of martyring and the physical death of Christ that he wrought salvation in and through us. Do not fall for anthropocentric doctrines and man-made doctrines that show us that man is the ultimate aim of God and Jesus is ultimately not truly God and Jesus is ultimately not raised from the dead because God uh, uh, just rose him from death spiritually. Do not fall for this. Look at the Bible. Look at what Scripture says in its full, in its, in its full context and understand that, that man is ultimately in need of God. You know, we also heard the following statement that, that man is so awesome. You know, what about Romans chapter 3 verse 9 to 19? What about 1 John chapter 1 verse 8? It shows us we need God. If you preach an ascended man, you preach a man ultimately that does not need the cross nor God. And that is not the God of the Bible. You know, this uh, theory that Jesus died spiritually is nothing new. It has been repeated through various teachers in the Word of Faith movement that ultimately proclaimed that Jesus had to die physically and spiritually uh, and ultimately wrought our salvation in hell. Uh, let me just say to you, when we believe in statements like that, what we do is, is we demean the holiness of Jesus Christ, the work of Jesus Christ, and ultimately we deplete sort of what is written in Scripture about the death of Jesus Christ. Uh, we can clearly see in John 19 verse 30 uh, that, that Christ's atoning work was finished on the cross. Jesus announced on the cross, it is finished. And then in Colossians chapter 2 verse 14, it, it tells us that the, the debt for our sins were nailed to the cross. In, in fact, let me read you various, uh, a few versions. In, in the ESV translation, it says, Cancelling that record or debt, nailing it to the cross. King James Version says, blotting out the handwritten ordinances, nailing it to the cross. New King James Version says, having wiped out the handwriting and the requirements, having nailed it to the cross. NIV says, having cancelled the written code, nailing it to the cross. The NRSV says, erasing the record that stood against us, nailing it to the cross. Uh, Young's literal translation says, having blotted out the handwritten in its ordinances, having nailed it to the cross. Uh, ultimately, we see that when Jesus died physically, that was enough. Jesus, when he died physically, you know, uh, one of the arguments will probably be the following. Jesus died. God cannot die. Therefore, Jesus could not be God. Well, number one, there's a problem with that. Because first of all, we believe in a hypostatic union. We believe in that Christ was perfect man and perfect God, 100%. Ultimately, when he laid down his life in the flesh, he didn't cease to exist. Death does not mean non-existence. In fact, when Jesus laid down his, his spirit in Matthew chapter 27 verse 15, we see that that was a, a, a physical death. But ultimately, we can see th that Jesus makes good to the promise on the cross in, in Luke chapter 23 verse 43, that today you will be with me in paradise. Meaning, Jesus is saying to the thief on the cross that there's a realization or a non-sensation of being after the death at the cross so we thank god for this when jesus died on the cross it was not a cessation of, of of him as a person jesus ultimately died physically in his body but in his spirit lived on and he could accept and inaugurate and bring that thief into paradise as scripture says jesus did not die spiritually and we need to be very clear about this but at two beginnings you had the beginning in Genesis, and then God had the beginning at the cross. Both beginnings started with an Adam. Genesis 1, 26, verse 28. So the cross was the regeneration of this plan. So if you understand this plan, you will understand why God had a cross. Please write this down. Paul did not proclaim Jesus Christ 
Paul proclaimed God through Jesus Christ. You cannot see God, you cannot have a relationship with God without going through the price Jesus Christ paid. But Paul reconciled God to mankind, not Jesus to mankind. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Romans 10, 17. You are but the product and belief by the word you heard. Of the word you heard. So whatever word you heard, if you heard the Muslim word, you would be a Muslim. Now if you heard the, uh, the AFM word, you would be AFM. If you heard the Roman Catholic word, you would be Roman Catholic. Remember guys, all of us. We also came out of the teachings of a trying God and Jesus is God. So we study the scriptures and says, and we say, no, it's not the truth. We're like Martin Luther. Come on, guys. 41 to 43 Christ, thousand Christian denominations. Which one preaches the true word of God? They all agree about one thing. How great is God? But they all disagree about one thing. How great is man and that man has the value of God? When man is preached to be less than a God kind in value, that is religion and denomination. That is not the kingdom and not the true gospel. God cannot expect man to represent him if man does not believe he is equal in the value of God. Where man is preached to be a God, God kind, in the image and the likeness of God, not a God by himself, you become God kind after you are born again, right? Eh? That is the true gospel and the kingdom of God. And as in heaven, so also in earth. Do you see what we are asked to accept here? First of all, Zander starts off and he speaks of God having two beginnings. Obviously, he's not speaking of God, but he's obviously speaking of this Adam species or God species that had its beginning in Adam and obviously its beginning with Christ. It is just fascinating to see that all forms of unitary systems ultimately have to divulge and make all a man a deified being to sort of be a mediator between God and man. Or they have to sort of make God a correlative to the universe to make God known. Ultimately, that is not what we see in the triune God. The interesting fact is that God is complete in himself because he is triune and is therefore not dependable upon this world. Ultimately, let me just say this as well. We can see quite clearly that, that God speaks of himself as being infinite. In Revelation chapter 4 verse 18, we are reminded, or 4 verse 8, sorry, we are reminded of the words where, where the angels are in front of the throne. And look, look at this triadic pattern, this Trinitarian pattern. Holy, holy, holy. Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh is, is our God. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, is, and is to come. You know, it is just beautifully depicted. And we can see... And therefore then that this very God that speaks in Revelation chapter 1 verse 8 makes himself known as being the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. Everything found its fulfillment in Christ. It's also fascinating to note, and you can go have a look at this, that in, that in Isaiah chapter 44 verse 6, God speaks to Israel and he says the following words. He says, I am the Lord your God. I make the expanse of this earth by myself. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Then again in Isaiah 48 verse 12, we can see the same words being uttered. Ultimately, we see Jesus repeating those very same words in Revelation chapter 22 verse 7 and also in verse 18, where Jesus speaks of himself as being emphatically the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. Ultimately, in Colossians chapter 1 and 2, we can see that this God, this Lord, this Jesus that we serve is the one that participates with God in the creation of the very world. So, biblically, we can see that God didn't have two beginnings. God stands by himself. Uh, and let me just move on to his next point. He, he said sort of that, that uh, the cross was a, a regeneration of God's original plan. Uh, let me just say, uh, original state uh, of man is God dwelling with man uh, and not man dwelling as a God. That is the original state of man, is intimacy with God, not to be God. The deception of the devil in Genesis chapter 3 was to be like God, to be a God species. You know, so, so let me just say this to you. Uh, uh, the chief end of man is obviously to worship God and to enjoy Him forever according to the 
beautiful Westminster Catechism. We can see also that in Isaiah chapter 43 verse 7, uh, we can see that God ultimately creates everyone for His glory. Therefore we can say assuredly that God made man to, to worship Him and to have intimacy with Him. But that God didn't create man in the beginning just to make him absolutely an autonomous being by himself that rules apart from God. Yes, we have authority, but that authority is delegated authority. It is given to us. Still, God says throughout the book of Psalms, throughout Scripture, He says, I have everything belongs to me. Our God is sovereign and He's not accountable to anyone nor subservient to the will of man at all. He said the third thing. He said Paul did not proclaim Jesus Christ. Wow. What a statement. Paul did not proclaim Jesus Christ. Uh, let's read together quickly what the scripture says. Uh, and I want to read you something coming from 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 to 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 to 6. Let me read this to you. Uh, if you say that the original plan of God was not to preach Jesus Christ. Let me just shock you and say this to you. In 2 Corinthians 4 uh, uh, verse 4 to 6. Paul says the following. Listen to this. He says. Uh, regarding them the God of this age have blinded their minds uh, of the unbelievers. So they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Who is the image of God. For we are not proclaiming ourselves or ourselves as God's species. But Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as slaves of Jesus. We didn't proclaim ourselves. Let me read it to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 23. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 23. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 23 says the following. Paul still speaking. He says the following. He says, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Let me read to you what he speaks of in Galatians. Galatians. Uh, the book of Galatians, we can see clearly that, that, that Paul speaks of the message that was preached. Uh, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, it says the following. Uh, let me read this to you. But even if an angel from heaven should preach to you another gospel, other than what we have preached to you, may a curse come upon him. What is the gospel? Let me read to you in verse 7. The gospel of Christ. Listen, in him. He says, yeah, we are in him. This is what, what he speaks of the Areopagus uh, preaching of Paul in, in Acts chapter 17. And, and then he says, you know, that you see Paul preached to them. It's in Christ we move, live and have our being. Yeah, this is a pagan saying, speaking of us being in God and us being his offspring. Uh, let me just say to you that ultimately the very sermon that Paul is speaking of and the very sermon he is speaking about and the very uh, 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 sort of Athenians that he's, uh, Athenians that he speaks with understood that, that that there was a separation of divine quality between God and man. Ultimately, we cannot say just from this one scripture that that was Paul's preaching or the earliest church kerygma. This was not the earliest preaching. The earliest preaching was Christ. You can go look again in Acts chapter 2. What is the preaching? The preaching is Christ crucified. So when somebody speaks and he says that the ultimate aim of God was, was to just redeem man and to make them a godlike species, we hear the following. He said that Paul reconciled God to mankind and not Jesus to mankind. Again, that is just absolutely false. Let me read to you what Paul speaks about in Colossians chapter 1. Uh, about uh, us being reconciled in Christ. In verse 18 he says, And Christ is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn amongst the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. That is in Christ. Verse 20. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth, things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. We are also reconciled in Christ, by Christ, through Christ, for Christ. Uh, he mentions, he speaks of Martin Luther. Uh, and you know, when somebody speaks of Martin Luther and he says, we are like Martin Luther. You know, if you start equating a cult with somebody like Martin Luther, with his 
a preaching of the word of God. Let, let, let me just read to you what Martin Luther believed about the person of Jesus Christ and the triune God. Uh, in a foreword to his Theologia uh, Crucis, uh, somebody writes the following. He says, Luther's intense preoccupation with the old ecclesiological theology of the Trinity is evident in his book, The Three Symbols, nine, uh, 1538. Uh, on the councils of the churches, 1539, and on the last words of David in 1543. He, he says the following, he says, For Luther, in its starting point in Psalms 33 verse 6, when three persons are named, the Lord, the Word, and the Spirit, yet David did not acknowledge more than one Creator, Luther understood, however, that this is the essential uh, uh, teaching of the Christian faith, that there's a single God in three persons and three persons in one single Godhead. Uh, let me read you some, uh, something from Luther himself. He says the difference is that he, the Father, and the, does not derive his Godhead from the Son or anything else. The Son is a person distinct from the Father in the same one paternal Godhead. The difference is that he, the Son, and uh, he is the Son, and that he does not have a Godhead for him from himself nor from anyone else. But the Father, since He was born from the Father, from eternity, therefore the Holy Spirit is a person distinct from the Father, and the Son in the same one Godhead. The difference is, is that He is the Holy Spirit, who eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son, and who does not have the Godhead from Himself, nor from anyone else, but from both the Father and the Son. And all this form from eternity to eternity. Noted. Luther says, we must understand here that all three persons as one God created the one humanity, clothed the Son in this and united it with His person so that only the Son became man and not the Father nor the Holy Spirit. Luther, unfortunately for you, Zander, believed in the biblical doctrine of the Trinity and he even went as far as to believe in Jesus being God. That is a fact. If you want the documents, I can send it to you. It's actually quite an enlightening read to see that Jesus ultimately was God. Zander then goes lastly and he speaks and he says the following. He says that denominations agree that God is great, but they disagree that the, about the greatness of man. And then he makes the following statement again. He says that man is the value of God. Uh, and then he says the following, he says, true doctrine teaches the value of man. You know, again, like I said, the very preaching of this word at Sunday's preaching is very anthropocentric. It is so focused on man that I want to read you something from Hank Hanegraaff, uh, the Bible Answers Man. He writes the following, uh, and let me just read this to you. It's just a beautiful, uh, uh, you know, quote from his book, uh, uh, Christianity in Crisis, page 125. He says, a doctrine that shrinks God to the status of man destroys an essential, uh, is, uh, destroys an essential, of, uh, essential of the historical Christian faith. No Christian should simply look the other way and pretend it does not matter. Once we allow the teaching of the nature of God to be twisted to the extent that it has, been, uh, it has, it has departed from the Christian faith, we have headed for the kingdom of the cults. Uh, let me just also say to you that Scripture makes it absolutely emphatically clear that, that Jesus obviously uh, came to redeem us, but that Jesus was God. Jesus was not the firstborn of many gods, like we would say and believe. Uh, but ultimately, Jesus was just God in Himself. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, we need to understand that if we're going to place man above God's esteem or above a uh, sort of God's perspective. What we are doing is, is we are making man and not Christ the crown of God's glory. Uh, in other words, uh, we, what we do is, is we are basically taking man and we equating and equivocating man with God. And that's not what the Bible says. And this is not what Orthodox Christianity believes. Friends, also allow me just to speak about this implicit deification of man. We hear Zander saying always that Genesis 1 verse 26 and 27 depicts sort of the understanding that, that man is just made in the image of God. Uh, let me just read to you what a, a, a scholar of Hebrew, Gleason Archer, speaks about. Uh, and the Hebrew scholar says the following. He says the following about the scripture. He says, the word likeness, Hebrew, demuth, defines and limits. The other word translated as image, the Hebrew tselem, in Genesis 1 verse 26 to 27, 
to avoid the implication that man is a precise copy of God, albeit miniature. The Hebrew word for likeness simply means a, a simpler, a similarity or resemblance, not identity. So, uh, uh, let me just read to you once more something that Hank Hanegraaf speaks of in, in page 117 about this deification of man. He says the following about the deification of man, or us being a God species. He says, it is also clear in the broader context of scripture that humans do not possess the divine nature of God. First, if we are exact duplicates of God, and we, of course, are men, then God must be a man. But the Bible emphatically states that God is not a man. Numbers 23, 19, 1 Samuel 15, verse 29, Hosea 11, verse 9. Second, God himself often makes statements of incomparability. How can there be any exact duplicates if God, of God if God states in Exodus chapter 9, 14, there is none like me in all of the earth? Third, Although we are created in the image of God, we possess none of God's non-transferable or incommunicable attributes, such as self-existence, immutability, eternality, omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, absolute sovereignty. God is eternal, Psalms 90 verse 2, but man was created at the point in, at, in a point of time, Genesis 1, 26 to 31, Job 3, 38, 4, 21, and has but a brief existence on, existence on earth. Job 7. God is life in himself, John 5, 26, but man is dependent on God to sustain him, Acts chapter 17, 28. God is all-powerful, Job 42, verse 2, but man is ultimately weak, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25. God is all-knowing, Isaiah 40, verse 13 to 14, Psalms 147, verse 5, but man is limited in knowledge, Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9. God is everywhere present, Jeremiah 23, 23 and 24, but humans are confined to a single space at time, Psalms 139, verse 1 to 12. Far from being a reproduction of God, human is more correctly portrayed as a reflection of God. The humans are created in God's image, and it simply means that they share, in a finite and imperfect way, the communicable attributes of God. Amongst these attributes are personality, spirituality, according to John 4, 24, rationality, includes knowledge and wisdom, according to Colossians 3, 10, and morality, including goodness, holiness, righteousness, love, and justice, and mercy, according to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. These attributes in turn give us the capacity to enjoy fellowship with God and to develop personal relationship with God. We should note at this juncture that Genesis never depicts humanity as some sort of autonomous sovereign, but as a steward entrusted with the care of his creator's creation. The cultural mandate makes it crystal clear that while God has given humanity dominion over some of his creative uh, creation according to Genesis 1 26 and 28 humans are still mere mortals and are therefore held responsible for how they've handled what was assigned to them by God L let me just also say to you that when we look at scripture scripture makes it emphatically clear that man is valuable in God's sight but Jesus and God is the most valuable uh, and let me just say when we hear things like Man is more valuable than Christ because Christ was the down payment, but, but you pay more for what is valuable than what was being paid with. It is just absolute heresy and a deification of man. Uh, please be reminded to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also to look at our Facebook page, to look for us on the internet and to make sure that you find us wherever we are. Thanks a lot.